system where there's protection for managers, you know, and uh, and it works both ways, not just managers who who get sacked, but also managers who want to leave uh, and have a protection for managers where, in my opinion, they can only be sacked in the January window. That's the only time when you can buy players and the only time you can sack them is January window or at the end of the season. Well, with our players and the Gerrards and the Carragers and people like that want to go into management, there's no protection from them. You know, they can't learn their trade. A managerial transfer or sacking window. What do you think, Robbie? Well, uh, you know, I wrote a few columns and that's one of the things I said last year that, um, you know, we should see that because when you see dismissal, when you when a club, you know, takes a gamble on a manager, oh, they, oh they've got a good manager. You know, I think these managers need at least a year to, to get the side together to have their... You know, Michael Abelton didn't even have a pre-season. He couldn't get his methods across. You know, what chance have managers got, especially young managers? Um, so I think it's, 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 a, it's a, you know, worthy idea, most definitely, and I think a transfer window for managers, I think I think it should be. Um, it protects managers, um, and, you know, if a chairman makes a decision, you know, they have to stick with it for at least, you know, six months. You know, that's still, in, a, in managerial terms, is, is a short period of time. So I think it, Paul Ernst is speaking a lot of sense there. Final question, who was going up with Cardiff, if you were to uh, have a stab at that now? Well, there's a few contenders. Hull have, have done exceptionally well under Steve Bruce. Watford, you know, they've got the player of the year in Vidra. You know, they've played some exciting football, you know, under Zola. Um, Crystal Palace, they've got Glenn Murray scoring goals. You know, I, I, I can't really, I don't really know. It's just, you know, lots of teams are losing games. There's no consistency. I think if Watford can put a run together, I think they'll be favoured. They've got a lot of players, obviously, from Udinese and Granada. They've used the loan system fantastically well. I don't think there's nothing wrong with it. Um, they haven't broke the, the rules. So I think Watford will have a, have a fantastic chance. But, you know, I worry the team I'd like to see is obviously Leicester, but mm, they've had such a fading. wobble. I think they've only won one in... They went to... You know, since they've been to Peterborough, I think they've only won one in nine or, or ten games. And I think Nigel Pearson is under serious pressure. So, you know, they need a couple of good results over Easter. Yeah, to make matters worse for Leicester, Forrest are going so well. Thank you very much indeed, Robbie. Uh, one yeah. other piece of football news to hand. Defender Breda Hungerland has just signed a new contract at Fulham. And that commits him to Fulham until the summer of 2015. Gosh, four potential employers for Michael Appleton in one season. Amazing, isn't it? I'd hate to, be, I'd hate to do his tax He's actually been in charge of a, of a team in the FA Cup. Three different teams in the FA Cup. Amazing. I hope he's got a good accountant with the complexity of his tax return this year. So many different employers. It's Five Live Drive. It's 33 minutes past six. Dominic Laurie and Ian Payne. Here's Orna, though, with the Easter weekend travel. Yes, and we will keep you updated right across the Easter weekend. The M6 looking very busy today. Northbound, Junction 14 at Stafford North. We had an accident. It has been cleared, but traffic is very busy heading towards Stoke-on-Trent on the M6 North. And again in Cheshire, the M6 on the northbound side at Junction 19 at Nutsford. We had an accident which has been cleared, but the queues are backing up to Junction 18 at Holmes Chapel. You're listening to 5 Live Drive. It is 6.34 exactly. On digital radio, digital TV, mobile and online. This is BBC Radio 5 Live. With the BBC News on 5 Live, I'm Rachel Hodges. For the first time in almost two weeks, banks in Cyprus have opened, although customers have only been allowed to withdraw €300. Euros. The banks closed when terms of an EU bailout were announced because of fears of a run on their reserves. Former South African President Nelson Mandela is said to be responding positively to treatment for a recurring lung infection. The current president, Jacob Zuma, has told the BBC the nation must not panic about the 94-year-old's health. Scotland Yard has passed a file of evidence linked to the Plebgate scandal to the Crown Prosecution Service. The former cabinet minister, Andrew Mitchell, resigned after being accused of insulting police officers in Downing Street. But there are now two separate inquiries into police conduct during the row. Journalists and technicians at the BBC are staging a 12-hour strike. Members of the NUJ and BEC2 unions walked out in protest at job cuts and alleged bullying and harassment. And the Met Office says this month is on course to be the coldest March since 1962. As of two days ago, the mean temperature was just 2.5 Celsius, 3 degrees below average. Coming up on 5 Live Drive. Should electric car drivers get free perks like the right to park on yellow lines, an exemption from congestion charges in London, and free parking? Actually, I was just seeing a survey the other day. The worst modern invention, as voted by readers of something, was the Sinclair C5 I used electric to, car. I used to live near the Sinclair C5 garage in London. One. 
No, and there were always people going around my house yeah? with this extraordinary white pedal car. A bizarre. 25 minutes to 7 o'clock, here's the sport with Will. The organisation Football Against Racism in Europe have filed a complaint to FIFA today over alleged racist chanting by England fans directed towards Rio and Anton Ferdinand during last week's World Cup qualifying game against San Marino. More from our sports news reporter Richard Conway. Football Against Racism in Europe campaign against and report on discrimination and have chosen to act following allegations of racist chants by England fans. The complaint is understood to centre on a song about the Manchester United defender Rio Ferdinand, who withdrew from Roy Hodgson's squad for the game, citing injury prevention concerns, before drawing criticism by flying to the Middle East to work as a TV pundit. His brother Anton, who was racially abused by Chelsea's John Terry during a match in 2011, was also allegedly targeted. The FA declined to comment this evening, saying they were still to receive notification of the report. But the matter now lies with FIFA, who could, if they uphold the complaint, either issue a fine or a harsher sporting penalty. Arsenal midfielder Abu Diaby faces another nine months out after tearing the anterior cruciate ligament in his left knee in training yesterday. The France international needs an operation. Paris Saint-Germain boss Carlo Ancelotti wants David Beckham to extend his contract at the club. Beckham joined PSG on a five-month deal in January. League One Coventry have been deducted 10 points by the Football League after going into administration. They have seven days to appeal. It now means they'll be 15 points off the playoffs. It relates to over a year's unpaid rent at the Rico Arena of £1.3 million. Andy Murray takes on Marin Cilic in the quarterfinals of the Miami Masters later this evening. On court now, though, is Maria Sharapova. Let's get the latest from David Law. In fact, Sharapova has won and she's into the final. A little bit unfair this one, really, because her opponent, Yelena Jankovic, finished her quarterfinal match at 20 to 10 last night. She was out on court just about 14 hours later and she looked completely exhausted and lost 6 2 6 1. David, thank you. And Oscar Pistorius' agent says the World Athletics Championships are a possibility for the sprinter after a judge changed his bail conditions with Pistorius awaiting trial for killing his girlfriend, allowing him to compete abroad. The IAAF have told us he can compete at the Worlds on the basis of innocent until proven guilty. Nine o'clock tonight. What have you got? Very nine briefly. Everyone says 9.30. That's not going to give me a head start, why. is it? It just says people it on our schedule. Tuning in halfway through. Then. What the hell is this? A chance to settle in. Nine o'clock. Yeah. Right. Hang the DJ. It's uh, 20 minutes almost to 7 o'clock and we've been waiting to hear from the South African President Jacob Zuma. Wait no longer because he's just done an interview with the BBC saying that Nelson Mandela is responding positively to treatment and that the nation must not panic. The President has been speaking to the BBC's Lerato Mbile. Well, as, as, as it has been reported, uh, he went to the hospital for checkup. <coughs> um, I've been given a report that uh, uh, he's there, he's responding very well to the treatment, which is good news. Um, and uh, of course, uh, I've been saying to people, we should bear in mind, Matiba is no longer mm. that young. Mm. And therefore, if he, if, he, if he goes for checkups now and again, I don't think uh, people must be alarmed about it. And I was saying, let us slow down the anxiety. He's responding very well. Mm. Uh, and he's in good hands, very good doctors. And I think all of that brings comfort to all of us and I would like to really to say uh, the country must not panic. Uh, Madiba is fine and would like to say to him, Diba, please <clears throat> get better quicker. We want to see you at home. Obviously you're getting reports. What can you tell us about his demeanor? We keep on hearing that he's conscious, but what does that mean exactly? No, <clears throat> I think they're trying to make people to feel they shouldn't think that uh, something has gone wrong, that he's still Madiba at that age, so to say, people must not be uh, worried and think otherwise. That's what I think uh, the, the people are trying to convey. But it is fair for the public to be worried. He has a recurring lung infection in December that was complicated by a gallstone operation. Last year there was a stomach problem. His age withstanding, is this a time for us to be aware of what is inevitable? <clears throat> well, I would imagine so. Um, and I, I think that's why people who would understand these things that the age itself will tell you. You know, you know, people who age, and in, I don't know, in other languages, <clears throat> in, in Zulu, there's a time when somebody passes away who's old, people say, he or she has gone home, who got to heal. 
uh, I think that those are some of the things we should be thinking about it. I know that uh, uh, we, we would want uh, be with us for a long time, and I think he has been with us uh, for a long time. Very few uh, outstanding personalities in the world live to this level. But I think he's so far, given the age, given all of those kind of things we're talking about, I think he has been able to handle it very well. Uh, and, and he has always responded very well when, when, when he gets mm -hmm. to the hospital. So let us just be mm -hmm. content and, and be, be, be okay. And finally, the, are you making any plans to go and see him? Of course, yes, at the right moment I will certainly do so. I will be communicating with the doctors. Uh, I will I'll be, at the right time, I will move. That's the South African President Jacob Zuma with the latest on Nelson Mandela's health. It's 19 minutes to seven. Swords, knives and a selection of guns were found at the home of the gunman who killed 20 children and six adults at a US school last December. Court papers released today also revealed that the 20-year-old fired 154 rounds in less than five minutes during the attack at the, ha at the Sandy Hook Elementary School in Newtown. Uh, Johnny Diamond is our Washington correspondent. Uh, Johnny, what exactly have we learned? today. We've learnt that uh, Adam Lanza clearly had a deep affection for guns and ammunition which he kept in vast quantities, a lot of it in a gun safe in his own bedroom and the list of guns and ammunition, knives and other accoutrements goes on over three pages in this search warrant that's been released. A couple of rifles, one of which he used to kill his mother, more than a thousand rounds of ammunition, knives, a bayonet, several samurai swords, eye protectors, ear protectors, um, holsters, ammunition holsters, you name it, it's there, along with, of course, a certificate from the National Rifle Association. Back at the school, in the car that he drove himself uh, to the school with, there was another uh, shotgun along with 70 more rounds. And as you say, there was details about how he actually carried out the slaughter at Sandy Hook Elementary School, shooting children in the first three classrooms that he found, shooting adults that he found there until he took his own life uh, with a shotgun. So probably a lot of um, food for thought there for thinking about gun control, which has pretty much stalled here in Washington, but a shocking amount of information about the arsenal that he and his mother kept at home. Johnny Diamond, our Washington correspondent, thanks a lot. It's Five Live Drive with Ian Payne and Dominic Laurie. Now, we've all got used to the blue badge scheme for disabled drivers, but how about a green badge scheme for electric cars? As many as, uh, of us gear up to hit the roads if we haven't already done so for the Easter getaway, a new report argues that drivers should be encouraged to go electric with perks such as free parking, an exemption from congestion charges, and the right to park on yellow lines. Mark Roney is from the Institute for Public Policy Research, and he co-wrote the report. Let's speak to Mark first of all. So are we hoping to encourage more and more people to use electric cars, and if so, why? Um, well, because we need to get more of them on our roads. Whilst the uh, government's uh, cash grants and tax breaks are good, um, our research has shown that if we need to get more of them on our roads, we need to make our roads more friendly. Looking at international examples, other countries offer these kind of incentives, um, and we feel that it would encourage people to buy more of these vehicles if they were just much easier to use. That's why we're asking for local authorities to work together to create incentives that work for the local area and uh, encourage drivers to... Uh, buy more of these vehicles. Okay, stay there, Mark, because also on the line is Paul Horrell. He's a motoring journalist. Why, evening. Why, evening. why do more of us not drive electric cars, Paul? Uh, well, that's easy, because they don't go very far. Uh, most of them have a range not more than 50 or 60 or 70 miles in the real world uh, when, they're, when they're fully charged, which is really like getting into your, your normal car and setting off on a journey when the uh, yellow low-fuel warning light is already shining at you. Um, you oh. know, they take away the fundamental freedom that a car gives you, which is to drive where you want, when you want. So I think that's, that's really why people don't like them. Also, they're very expensive. Um, that's somewhat ameliorated by the fact that uh, there are already major incentives in place. You get a £5,000 or up to £5,000 um, grant from the government to reduce the price of the car. Um, but even that isn't enough. And um, I think, you know, if, if you had something like a blue badge... Um, or a green badge scheme, as they're calling it, for mm -hmm. electric cars. Um, it may well encourage very prosperous people to um, to drive into city centres. But um, you, you know, using electric cars to drive into city centres. Um, 
doesn't really help the environment simply because simply because it would in- increase congestion, particularly if they're able to park in places um, uh, which would just block the traffic for the rest of us. Um, you know, right. that's why that's why yellow lines are there. They're there to keep the traffic moving, and if they block the traffic, um, they will just cause more congestion, which generally means more cars sitting there with their engines running, well, wasting it, fuel. It sounds like you've custard pied the idea already. Mark, how do you respond to that? Too expensive, not enough people using it, and it's easy to see why. Well, on the expense issue, the government does offer both cap grants and tax incentives, and our research has shown that over a period of years of owning these vehicles, um, employees of the public sector and of businesses that might buy them for them can save thousands of pounds. Um, in terms of... But if they don't go very far... Well, They're again, not worth I'll, having, are they? Well, I'll take issue with Paul okay. on that because it's not necessarily true. Some of the electric vehicles are hybrid vehicles, and they don't oh, have yeah, any range concerns. If you bought, sorry if I may interrupt, but if you bought a, a plug-in hybrid, um, it would just, it, it could very well just be a way of gaming the system. You get your five thousand pounds off the government, and because these things can run on petrol as well, you would just drive around on petrol all the time and never plug it in. <laughs> well, if, if that was a correct analysis, um, well, we wouldn't be so far behind. Well, hold on, hold on a minute, Paul. Let Mark, let Mark answer that Forgive one. Me. If you look at our European neighbours, we are 15th behind them in terms of take-up of these vehicles, and they are using these incentives to encourage people to buy them. So if you look at Norway, which has free um, uh, use of bus uh, lanes in Oslo, has free parking, um, allows them to use the toll roads, they're, they're way ahead. Denmark, which doesn't even have serious um, uh, tax breaks or uh, cash grants for them, uh, they just basically allow them free parking and give them priority on a very long waiting list. But, um, very Denmark quickly, because we've got to move on. Go on, Paul. Well, sorry, I was going to say, Denmark and Norway have a very high proportion of renewable electricity. In this country, we don't. If you look at the, um, the carbon content of the electricity that we have in this country, if you, if you, if you charge up uh, one of the, the, the current electric cars, such as, say, a Nissan Leaf, you'd find that its, it's um, emissions would be about 60 grams per kilometre, um, taking into account the carbon in the electricity. Now, actually, um, diesel cars are getting quite close to that now, and certainly hybrid cars are. So the, the trouble is, if you incentivise a technology which, it, um, which doesn't really have much of a chance of imp- improving our carbon, um, uh, reducing our, our CO2 output as a nation, um, I think you're kind of barking up the wrong tree. I'm very much in favour of truly green cars, but um, the electric cars that you're talking about, used in the way that you're talking about, um, unfortunately aren't really a, a, aren't a solution. Gentlemen, I've got to leave it there. I'm very, very sorry. just want to read out one great text on this subject from Mark in Kent, who says, I drive an electric car. I definitely do not expect to park on yellow lines, but I do expect to be able to park in allocated spaces. Really annoying when other cars use them. I don't park in front of fuel pumps when I stop to buy milk at the garage. Also, no congestion charges. Good. We don't pollute the city air. Thank you, Mark. The excellent.